Hello and welcome back to Cinematic Universe, everyone. My name is Ernesto Martinez. It's Star Wars month, and every day until the end of the box office run, it's going to be Star Wars Day with Star Wars Episode 7, The Force Awakens. That's right, Star Wars has returned, and with our reviews, we're going to do something a little bit different because I've already planned to do a group review for this movie, and it's a lot of people, and everybody has a schedule, and our first round of reviewers is going to be myself, yours truly, Benjamin, and Catherine. How are you guys? Good. I'm doing good. So, Catherine, you've been riding on a very high, well, Star Wars high, for <laughs> the past few days since the movie opened. Why don't you lead us off? I absolutely love the fact that throughout this movie, they don't shy away from the fact that they're trying to mimic the beats of the original film, but at the same time, they don't just recycle the same old dialogue and cliches over and over again, because what makes this movie really stand out amongst all the other movies is the immediate chemistry you have between the two new leads. I mean, it's just immediate. The humor's there. It's not, like, cheesy like you had with the prequels. Uh, better actors. I mean, yeah, we like Mark Hamill as Luke, but, you know, even he's a bit, you know, honest about his acting abilities, and, you know, the casting for this, Daisy Ridley and John Boyega, they just hit it out of the park with these two. It was perfect. Uh, same with Adam Driver. Uh, granted, there is a news today of a fake Twitter account talking about how Kylo's an emo and all that kind of stuff, <laughs> but it's actually funny because I completely empathize with that character because... As you get through the movie and find out a little bit about his backstory, it's like, yeah, I can imagine if I was sent off to go train at a Jedi temple and be, a, you know, rejected by my mother, abandoned by my father, and virtually enslaved by my uncle. Yeah, that probably really pissed me off, too. Hmm. <laughs> but yeah, it didn't come off as emo at all. I could totally connect with all of the characters, even with the lack of backstory, which admittedly I thought was probably my biggest caveat with the movie, because your biggest, you know, moment is, like, hinging on backstory, which is only given to you in two expository dialogue sequences, but everything else was just perfect. The action, the story, the beats to it, they keep the right things mysterious, they just keep you right in the groove of, this is the story we're telling, we're not going to bog you down with boring politics, and I loved how they just, uh, you know, for the Republic, they only show it, like, what, once for, like, maybe ten seconds? And uh, what a great way to introduce the Republic, by blowing it up. That's just perfect. It's like, <laughs> that's what we thought of. The this is what we think of politics and Star Wars, people. Yeah, let's just get rid of it. Perfect. Uh, same with not having any annoying side characters like Jar Jar Binks or Ewoks or anything like that. But what ultimately makes this movie work, as it was with the original trilogy, is the emphasis on characters driving the story as opposed to plot or action. Granted, there was a lot of action in this mm. movie. None of the action scenes were there for the sake of, you know, rewarding the audience for being patient. Every action scene moved the story along in one form or another. Uh, even something like uh, exit the, the first Millennium Falcon fight. Like, sure, yeah, you could just take a spaceship and take off, but that's, like, really boring, so let's do it in a more interesting way. What do we learn from that? Oh, wow, Ray's a really great pilot, and, po and uh, what's his name? Finn's a really great shooter. So each little action scene brings something out of the characters, brings something new to it, so nothing feels wasted in this movie. Uh, and you get new stuff from old characters, too. It's like uh, the dynamic between Han and Chewie. Yes, it's the same. But uh, well, how do they enhance it? Well, we're going to have Han pick up Chewie's bowcaster and just try and see if we can run with that type of humor and see where that leads us. Leia, okay, yeah, she's still a politician, and we're not going to try and drive that too far home because we don't like politics in Star Wars. It's clearly emphasized. Sure, you're missing things like uh, 3PO and R2. We don't really get enough of them, which is understandable, but BB-8 is probably the, hands down, the best new character for me in this movie because it's just, he registers also immediately the second you see him, and he carries the movie on its own, just like uh, as you had with R2-D2 in the original Star Wars, being the one who's like, you know, the MacGuffin, if you will. Everybody's trying to get BB-8. And just none of, the, none of this just felt slow at all. It was perfect. It was like a return to the original Star Wars classic, you know, fun characters. Just uh, were not, it's like the filmmakers weren't interested in trying to get an agenda across. They were more interested in having fun and just going back to that original formula. And that's why this movie just it succeeds in spades. I haven't been able to stop smiling since last Thursday when I first saw this movie. I almost feel like a kid again. That's what I said, I think, on my way to 
the first viewing of this movie. In a world where there there is new Star Wars again, I there's nothing that makes me happier. I agree with everything that Catherine has said, especially the point of the immediate you know, chemistry between all of the new characters. I was talking with a friend shortly before we started recording this, and he said that there was more chemistry between Finn and Poe in two minutes than there was between Anakin and Obi-Wan throughout all three of the prequels. I have to... It's not that bad, but having recently rewatched all six in preparation for this new movie... I have to agree with him. With that said, I like all the pre-existing movies for what they are, but we're not here to talk about that. Daisy Ridley, John Boyega, Adam Driver, and Oscar Isaac, I love each and every one of them. And of course, BB-8. There's, I can't pick one that I like the most, which I know is in contradiction to something that I posted at like not half an hour ago about me crushing on Daisy Ridley. <laughs> They're all great. They're all so I don't want to like heap on too much hyperbole here, but they oh, okay. fit in each of their roles wonderfully. I couldn't see anyone else in them. I can't wait to learn more about each of them. I'm just really happy. <laughs> all right. Well, let's see. Opening, I guess, midnight around premiere. Not midnight, because after, I guess, 2012, they started opening uh, for Thursday night, 7 o'clock showings and 10 o'clock showings, and then midnight showings. So I went for the 10.30 showing on Thursday. Standing in line for three hours, and for anybody who noticed my Facebook page on that day, I was posting like every other hour, three hours ago, two hours ago, one more freaking hour. I still can't believe you did that. <laughs> it's I don't do it much. And it really took it, it really takes a toll on a person when you're having to stand around and sit around and really have nothing else to do. Which thank God that we're still human beings and we're able to form conversations with the person next to us. And thank, <laughs> and thank God I managed to do that with this I'm going to say over sixty year old person who told wow. me basically his life story up with Star Wars about how he saw the first one before it was called A New Hope in the theaters when he stood in line for Empire and when he stood in line for Jedi and had a group of teenagers ruin the fact that Luke and Leia were brothers and sisters without watching the movie. So I'm getting all this history from this person. I'm pretty much, you know, building my anticipation as I'm in line. And then there's this girl kind of ruins it by trying to make a feminist statement with Jessica Jones, but that's a conversation for another day. <laughs> so there I am in the IMAX theater. I managed to find a nice sweet spot. And that moment where after you go through all the trailers, after you go through all the marketing of you know the yeah. theater chain, and all of a sudden... Thank God we did. I didn't see the the Disney logo pop up because I would have felt really out of place for some reason because you're so used to the 20th Century Fox one. I loved that they got rid of the Disney logo. I loved that. That was the first big smile on my face. And they just had Lucasfilm, and you're like, here we go. And uh -huh. then you see a long time ago in a galaxy yeah. far, far away. Yeah. Here first it comes. Kitty reliving it. And all exactly. of a sudden, John Williams' epic score. <laughs> and the entire theater erupts. And from then all the way to the second act, I myself, not just as a fan of the Star Wars franchise, as it is, as, you know, very evident in the box office these days, the ultimate movie-going franchise, the ultimate marketing merchandising franchise, it's the ultimate of everything, whether you like it or hate it. That's just what it is. Star Wars is something that is not just limited to, to the geek culture, it is expanded to our pop culture as a species. And all the way to the second act, I'm like, wow, I am really running this high. And we'll get to my thoughts on everything after that with Ray and Kylo and all that stuff later in the review. But uh, like you guys said, the chemistry between Poe Dameron and Finn 
very, you know, it's like instant. You're already invested in these characters. You can tell that Oscar Isaac was having fun the moment he st- he shows up on on screen. He is, you know, he's like a child playing with the greatest toys ever in the world. You see Finn, who, you know, I think it's because of Finn that this is the first time that we get to see blood spilled in the Star Wars universe. I don't remember blood being anywhere on screen in Star Wars until now. It kind of reminded me of Pixar movie Up when you first see blood in in an animated movie of 3D caliber. Um, You know, it does have, it did have the original feel like all the, everything felt like, yes, it's been 30 years and everything pretty much looks the same, but to the point where it's like, we're in the, you know, the proper universe, we're in the proper stage. The characters really drive everything home. Daisy Ridley, amazing. She is the wild card. She knocks it out of the park. The return of Han and Chewie, their relationship could, their relationship could not be any better. Like, you know, giving each other crap like from every time they're on screen. So everything is, you know, going great. That being said, there are some moments of disappointment that I just can't ignore. Number one, the big grand mother of them all, Captain Phasma. Oh, yeah. Yep, yep, yep. You fucking failure. So much time developed for this script. So much time developed about you want to get the right characters. You want to make sure it's well balanced. The demographics are there. All the big things. They made such a big thing about when they released the cast, you know, the picture of the cast for The Force Awakens, how the internet was just like, oh, there aren't enough women in there, and then a few days later, they cast Lupita Nyong'o for Mas Katana, and they cast um, for Captain Phasma, who was originally a male character, they turned into a female, Gwendolyn Christie, and I'm like, wow, that's real talent, Gwendolyn Christie, man, she's moving up in the world, and they're making such a big deal out of Captain Phasma. Until you realize that she was just being made a deal like Boba Fett. She's just a toy. They're selling her. And she is shit in the movie. Literally. She comes down to being the butt end of a joke about a trash compactor. That's basically it. And And she showed promise. The moment you see her, it's just like, Sir, what's of the villagers? Exterminate them. And she... She's calling out orders. She's barking out orders. And you're thinking for somebody to be Captain Phasma, the one who's basically leading all the stormtroopers behind Kylo Ren and Domhnall Gleeson's General Hux, nothing. Absolutely nothing. It's... Oh, my goodness. I'm sorry. It's just... I had to get that out of my <laughs> chest real quick. <laughs> Cap- I kind of felt a little the same way about Poe because he was announced alongside Daisy Ridley and John Boyega as, you know, Oscar Isaac as these are the three new guys and it was clear from the ages that... From the age groups they had that, okay, you got the... The Luke Leia dynamic, and then you got like Han. They were the three main guys that advertised the entire time, and he doesn't really do much in the movie. And granted, they will fix that for the future. And originally, I read an article where they were actually going to kill him off in the beginning, in the same way that you think he dies in the beginning of the movie in the Tie Fighter crash. And Isaac was actually debating whether or not he wanted to do that small role. And while he was thinking about it, he calls up Abrams, calls him, and, he, and uh, Isaac's like, "You know what? I'll do it." He's like, Abrams tells him, you know what, I found a way around it, you'll be in the whole movie, we'll figure this out. And it's like, man, they're, the way that they're just trying to think, like, writing this type of stuff on the fly, like you mentioned Captain Phasma, it's like they only cast a girl because people were complaining about, oh, there's not enough women in the Star Wars universe. Like, given how much they played up Poe and is being alongside these three, I really wanted to see more from him. But granted, I liked the, the, his replacement, which was basically Han Solo, because that's, like, awesome to have Han leading a Star Wars movie. Yeah. Which brings... Which really brings up to Han my Solo. Next negative. I mean, oh, here, hold on, hold on, right here. Before we get to that, let me let me ask you two a question. Uh, I've been listening to a lot of movie review podcasts that cover The Force Awakens, just because I don't want this feeling of happiness and giddiness to be over yet. Mm-hmm. And one that I started listening to earlier today, I believe it was the Slash Filmcast. Maybe it was another one. Uh, Rejected the idea of Phasma being the one who attacked Finn on Takodana. 
the one who attacks Finn with the the shock baton. Yeah. Instead of, instead of the the random trooper, I think that would have been a much better idea because then it would have one it would have given her her own scene, which she honestly should have had. Maybe there are some deleted scenes that we will see with the Blu-ray release, or maybe it just didn't work out. Maybe this was how it was planned the entire time. We don't know. But I, I, doubt, I doubt there's wish. a deleted scene to even salvage whatever happened to the character. Because yeah. given as a person of her position to be taken into, I guess... Uh, rebel custody and you know all that as easily as she was i'm like i'm sorry you should be able to find a way out of the situation like that little shock trooper managed to you know have his day in you know in battle yeah, that's pretty cool how she ended up getting caught i mean you kind of want to see chewie have his day in the sun okay but point still right, stands that she amounted to absolutely nothing in this movie true yeah true. Exactly. On, the, on the reverse side this is these are two totally different things this is uh, Gwendolyn Christie, the same woman who played Brianna Tarth in Game of Thrones that had one of the best fight scenes in... Crap, what season was it? I'm going to say, what, three? Three, maybe. That incredible fight scene, I guess, regardless, with the Hound. Mm -hmm. Perhaps all of us collectively, I guess, built it up too much with the assistance of the overzealous marketing... Or maybe they're holding it off to like a later movie once Finn is Perhaps, cost you for yes. this. I, like, I did see or read some, I guess, articles or comments saying that she is confirmed for at least uh, one more movie, if not episodes, or the, the next two movies. Hopefully, we'll see. She will get her own scene in the next movie. Yeah, I well, hope so. anyway. Unfortunately, at this point, I couldn't give two shits about it until that day comes because i'm sorry you had a moment to do it and you didn't and you blew it but as i was saying here comes yeah. my next negative han solo oh, everything you know him he was han solo harrison ford felt like han solo he didn't feel like grumpy harrison ford it you know han solo was back doing han solo things having the bromance again with chewie and everything and in the most telegraphed scene that I've, you know, to memory, mimicking Empire Strikes Back, you know, the whole the whole revelation that Han Solo is Ben Solo's, you know, father, Kylo Ren. That entire moment, I mean, you couldn't have telegraphed that any more clearly that Han Solo's about to die. And it also yeah. didn't and it also didn't help the fact of the major plot hole of Kylo Ren sensing that Han Solo is in the vicinity, but when he walks in there, he can't even sense him three feet behind him. I think he, he baited him out on, onto the catwalk. Probably. But that last part was more of a nitpick, and I apologize for that. But either way, going to the catwalk is just like, you're going to die, you're going to die, you're going to die. Holy I shit, like what the fuck are you doing? It. I like that they didn't make it a big thing that he was his father. They just kind of mention it. You know, it's like, oh yeah, kill your father, Han Solo, you know? Yeah, because uh, everybody kind of knows that moment is coming. Because you know, even though he's not playing the Alec Guinness type Obi Wan Kenobi, uh, going with the beats of the original movie, it's clear that that's gonna happen. And I kind of expected that even back in April, because the first two trailers, you know, emphasized the Falcon was the the Falcon was the biggest takeaway from the trailer over a year ago, and then mm -hmm. Chewie were home was the biggest takeaway from the second one. And they had insisted at the panel for Celebration Anaheim that the, the returning characters weren't overshadowed the new ones. And I'm thinking, as long as you have somebody like Han Solo around, that's he's always going to overshadow your new characters <laughs> in one way or yeah. another, whether he intends to or not. And so yeah. I, I expected that coming a long ways away, which and I guess Abrams and the writers did too, because, you know, the setting of the catwalk and with the light shining down, like this perfect shaft of light, and the big wide shot showing him standing, you know, they were making it so clear that it was going to happen that... Uh, you know, there was no surprise that, okay, and it didn't feel lazy either, because it took till my second viewing to kind of pay more attention to the few clues to Kylo's backstory to figure that, yeah, I can see why he's, you know, going through with it. Uh, I, myself, I, and I've seen the movie twice already, I still found it a bit lazy. Felt something that you could have hauled off for the next one, but, which is another complaint that I probably have and will get to. But, yeah, that was 
those pretty much are my two really big negatives. The rest that I'll probably get into is just some things that didn't really sit too well with me, but don't exactly ruin the movie for me. It just kind of like takes me out of it. For example, Ray. Love Daisy Ridley. I can totally buy that a character who's been on a desert planet, which is pretty much a junkyard planet. I mean, yeah. as, it's pretty much a junkyard planet. Every, so, character, yeah, like, every other character calls it a junkyard and questions yep. their logic of wanting to go back there. So yeah, you're right. Yeah, it's a junkyard planet. Ray's been surrounded by technology and, you know, uh, shuttles and whatever kind of cruiser and all that stuff. She's been surrounded by that all her life. So it stands the reason that she would be a capable pilot, even though she herself wouldn't know if she would survive flying the Millennium Falcon for the first time. It's really a sense of the moment when she's captured and the interrogation between her and Kylo Ren all the way to the ending of the movie that I just kind of felt that, and I'm going to be careful here, I felt that she was a little overpowered. And I know that when I say that, I'm taking into consideration that when Luke Skywalker used the Force to take out the Death Star, that he did it with little to no training. But I don't know, I guess the execution of her being able to... And I know there's supposed to be an explanation to why, but for this movie alone, as it's supposed to stand on its own two feet, without the need of having episode 8 and 9 to explain everything else. I just felt that her natural like use of Jedi mind trick and everything else just felt a little out of place for me, and it didn't really take me out of the movie. It's just that, I don't know, it didn't really sit well with me. And I'm not hating on it. I just don't think it was handled as well as other people are saying it was. Well... I, for one, will have to respectfully disagree. I can sort of see where you're coming from with that. It would have been overpowered if, wildly overpowered, if she had gotten the mind trick to work on the first try, or if she'd been leaps and bounds better than Kylo when they fought, or even more wild, is if she hopped into an X-Wing and blew up in the oscillator herself instead of Poe. But I, it, it all worked for me. It was all believable for me. Nothing with her took me out of it to backpedal just a little bit for Han. It, that scene was... A little obvious, sure. It it was much easier to pick up for me, anyway, on the second and third viewings. Yes, I have seen this movie three times. But the first time, it was... I suppose I knew that it was happening. It was just more of a leaning back in my seat, like, nervously anticipating what was going to happen. It's like, don't do it. Don't go out there. You're going out there. What are you doing? <laughs> Each and every time that I saw that scene, I'm not ashamed to say that, it got to me. Because this Star Wars is something that has been a major part of my life for almost my entire life. Like, I was relatively late or watching the original trilogy, but these are all characters that I've essentially grown up with. So to see Han dealt with in that way it was painful i'll be honest it was painful for me and perhaps a lot of the other fans out there too telegraphed or not it made sense and i look forward to seeing how kylo's story plays out from here or from there excuse me but uh no it, yeah. as far as ray goes the I mean, snoke himself says that there has been an awakening in the galaxy, in the, in the yeah. forest. That's and why that's willing to forgive her skills, because even Abram said not only does the title refer to Ray, but it refers to Kylo as well. Yes, precisely. So this, like, we don't know exactly everything that happened in the 30 years between uh, Jedi and now, but we're led to believe, at least I was, that 
once Kylo turned to the dark side, and we see the flashback of him and supposedly the other Knights of Ren slaughtering all the other Jedi, that perhaps, and I don't know if this is a thing that could happen, the Force went into a state of dormancy. And then once we get to this movie and the things happen that they do, or the way that they do, you know, they, it, it wakes back up, for lack of a better term. Yeah, I, I have my own pet peeve theory about what that entails as well. And to the point about Han, when I first saw the movie, I didn't feel anything in that scene because it was you know so set up, you knew it was coming. And, and I didn't really feel it until later when they got back to the Rebel base and they're all kind of upset about it. But the second time I watched it, when they got into that just that location where they're getting ready to set the bombs... And he gives him the detonator, and I could feel it, and I was already starting to get to me. Like, I could feel you know, my heartbeat starting to slow down because I did not mm-hmm. want to see it happen again. Because yeah. it's like, I love Han Solo. I've been living for, like, 25 years. I don't want to see that happen. And, I mean, even the dialogue in that scene was a little off, the way that, you know, Kylo's talking like a total, you know, drunk, drink the Kool-Aid. Oh, the Supreme Leader is wise, and, you know, blah, blah, blah. But, uh... All right. Well, I doubt yeah, he was of- drinking the Kool-Aid. I think he was just, you know, setting it up, like... Like a ceremonial thing to you know, huh? yeah, psych yeah. mostly. Yeah, and for for most of that part, I I felt that the dialogue, at least or from Ren, the whole thing was felt like it had double meaning to me. It could have yeah. gone either way. It was only when the I don't know if it was a sun nearby sun was like the last amount of light had mm-hmm. gone out of the sky that. He knew what he was going to do, and he did it. That's why I liked one, one of the things I liked about that scene. Yeah, I loved his acting in that scene because I was daring to think that you know maybe he's not going to do it, and I'm looking at his eyes and I'm trying to figure out is he going to do it? Is he going to do it? And then I was just like doubting it up until the light finally left. I'm like, yeah, he's going to do it, and uh, that was tough. And then you know, Snoke was another interesting point to that because he's like, you, know, you must kill your father to stop this fight between you. And I'm thinking. Well, why does Snoke care? It's like, Kylo, yeah, he's interesting because he's not a Sith, but why is he, uh, you know, facilitating Kylo's personal, you know, vendetta over whatever the First Order is trying to accomplish? Uh, And, of course, there's the other Knights of Ren, wherever they are, we don't know. Which is why I have a pet peeve theory as to who Snoke actually is. Another plot hole. Yeah, that they didn't want to explain. Because I was, you know, I'm... I bought the Star Wars Visual Dictionary. I was reading things in it, and it kind of sheds some light on some things. It keeps other things in the dark. But, yeah, I have my theory on Snoke. I think they might confirm it in the next one. I mean, certainly they're going to have to tell you more about him in the next movie. Because the way that Leia was talking about him, even that even Tan was talking about him, that they're certainly very familiar with him. So, mm-hmm. And that's kind of odd, because when Tarkin name-drops the Emperor in the original Star Wars, it's not a surprise, because, well, it's an empire. Of course there's going to be an Emperor there's a leader. But since this First Order is kind of like you know, risen from the ashes, these diehard loyalists, because I made, you know, I made the uh, um, analogy almost like the boys from Brazil, because it's kind of what it is. It's like a bunch of, you know, Nazis who ran away, and they're trying to, you know, come back together and, you know, fight back, and it's like, well, they don't really need, (laughs) they don't really need a dark and shadowy supreme leader in order to do that, and yet they have one anyway, which is why I was thinking that when you take into consideration what Snoke looks like, the uh, mystery as to the title, and I thought, yeah, I think I know who he is and what he's up with, but we'll see. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, again, I just want to state that I'm not trying to take away from the character of Ray because overall, I love the character, and Daisy really does a phenomenal job. It, it really just was the, that those last few moments between her and, you know, use, and her use of the Force that just, you know, I just couldn't buy into it for some reason. And even after a second watch, I still can't buy into it. And that's that's pretty much it. And I'm looking forward to her having a double-bladed lightsaber because it pretty much seems like that's just going to be her choice of weapon moving forward because it's, she's been more used to using a melee type of weapon. So, you know, first time on the big screen seeing a Jedi using a double-bladed lightsaber, which it feels like that's the way it's going to go. Now, would you say it's, she's going to get a, double, a double-bladed lightsaber, or do you think they're going to go with the... Uh, oh, this is like heavy into the former expanded universe territory. Do you think that they're going to give her a, a light staff? Since that's... Probably. Like, she I mean, it's not another realm of possibility. I mean, 
with Ben Solo here in this movie, they're pretty much dipping into the no longer canon expanded universe. Instead of calling him Darth Cadius, they're calling him Kylo Ren. Well, that's because <laughs> Darth is more of a Sith title. I know, I know, I'm, I know, but I'm just saying that they might as well admit mm. that they're going to be dipping into expanded universe. It's not as dead as they said it is. They're just going to draw from it regardless. That's true, because the Knights of Ren are said to be ancient. That's why he has that, why he made the cross guard lightsaber. It looks, you know, ancient. Yeah, like and he's I, trying to homage something. And one of my great uh, admirations of the use of the of, of Kylo's lightsaber is that it's about as unstable as the character is, you know, through yeah. Oh, yeah. visual storytelling. Really like so you can imagine my, my glee watching him throw his temper tantrum up on the <laughs> starship when the officer told him that they lost a robot. So, <laughs> another thing. Robot and, stole a starship. No, it had help. <laughs> yeah. Another thing that really, you know, we're talking about the rep, the the Republic and, you know, the First Order. It's amazing how the Republic allowed the First Order to amass its army as much as it did. And they, they, they never really touched that well upon, you know, the current standing between the two fighting sides. No, they didn't. Supposedly, I was reading on my visual dictionary, and it says that, you know, uh, the First Order isn't nearly as big as the Galactic Empire was, which is why they're isolated out in the unknown regions of the galaxy, and that the New Republic was actually pretty small. Their entire star system was pretty much wiped out in the movie, but that they didn't formally recognize the Resistance. They would just kind of, you know, help them out under the table. So apparently, as much as the First Order wants to destroy the Republic, it's not like the Republic was so huge... Or the First Order was so huge that it was something that each other had to really worry about. I know, but in 30 years? They couldn't really... Well, it's a wild, wild west, you know, after after yeah. the end of... Because the thing at the end of Return of the Jedi, when you have no Death Star, no Emperor, no Darth Vader, and with the Emperor having dissolved the Senate in the original movie, then it's like, there's no more bureaucracy, so all the Imperial governors are going to you know start fighting for power, and, you know, civil mm. war is on, you know? All right. Mm -hmm. Well, it's it's telling if you if either of you noticed when they brought Poe on board the ship, which that in and of itself I guess says how limited they are. We never see more than just the one star destroyer. Yeah, in, and in that entire planet, they only have the one thing. But when they bring Poe on board, like he's he's fighting with the guards because they're shoving him around. But once he gets steps out, and he takes a look. It says, like, says it on his face. He's like, holy, oh my god. They they have all of this. This is worse than we thought. So maybe... That's right. That they, reminds it, me, though. I did also read that in the Visual Dictionary, that the Star Des that specific Star Destroyer is in direct violation of a military disarmament treaty signed with some of the Republic and the last, you know, okay, but, offshoots of the Empire. Okay, but that's... Be well... <laughs> You know, how am I supposed to know that? I'm not reading the... Exactly. Uh, but that, like he said, you get yeah. that proposed face a bit. Exactly. Kinda I'm like taking how... what the movie's giving me in its own context, and contextually, contextually speaking, it's a little all over the place. True. So, I mean, <laughs> it's nice to have those, you know, visual aids and stuff like that to help you answer some of those questions, but my focus is on the big screen. It's not... I'm, I, don't, I, don't, I shouldn't have a dictionary with me with stuff like this. And I'm not okay. saying, and I'm not saying to be, you know, really hard on the movie because Lord knows, my favorite movies of all time have many plot holes and things that were are never fully explained. It's just a little frustrating when they have that one little moment and you're the entire time thinking to yourself, "How the fuck did you guys get so much power?" <laughs> <laughs> that's the that's the one little thing. But I mean, we're kind of running a little over here, and. Like I said, since I'll be reviewing this with other people, I'll probably be expanding other stuff with other people. So we got this out of the way. Overall, it's a good movie for me. I don't. It's not perfect. I, um, it really is Star Wars coming back to true form after you know thirty years of not seeing you know the original characters on the big screen. And I'm still to this day asking myself how much did Mark Hamill get paid to just stand on a rock for two minutes. Yeah, um, <laughs> to get top billing. To get to sec to top the billing. Sec second top billing. At least it makes sense why Harrison Ford walked away with a big payday because he knew what he was getting himself into. He might as well ask for as much as he could before he they you know told him to jump ship. Yeah, 
I, I would think that he didn't want to do three movies. I would think that would be his was probably his decision. Probably, and I would say it's even a, a contract stipulation for him. Probably. Yeah. Even uh, they released a new article this weekend uh, that Abr- in EW and Abram said that when they were writing it, they did they had no allusions to the fact that you know that Harrison's distancing himself from the franchise, and they knew they had to have something huge happen here to since they had a villain specifically with Kylo Ren who was not a full bred villain yet. He's in the process of changing that they needed him to do something which was so huge that it was going to really resonate for the audience, and at the same time find a way to deal with the issue of. Uh, you know, Harrison being like, yeah, like he said, he originally stipulated, I'm not going to come back if it's just a cameo, I'm not going to come back if it's a bunch of green screens, and I'm not going to come back if I'm just going to sit in the cockpit of the Falcon the entire time. So we can wanted least, to have a purpose. So we can at least rule out that he'll be a Force Ghost next movie? Of course. Yes. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a yeah. Jedi ability. Hey, hey. It's it, Yoda even it's, had to it's, go through trials and tribulations to figure out how to become a Force ghost. It's it's the Force. It can do whatever the fuck it wants. At hey, this hey, point. hey! To quote Han, that's it's not how stunk. the Force works. Yeah. yeah, but apparently they won't lose their shit if somebody who's allegedly supposed to know how to get into Star Killer Base is just a sanita- sanitation person. Uh, <laughs> the same thing with the lightsaber. Like she touches the lightsaber and she has a psycho vision. I never heard of that happening before. <laughs> exactly, and ever since that that's happened, how that works. <laughs> yeah, exactly, and ever since that happened, that's when my frustrations with Ray began. But overall, I would give this movie after everything, well, at least some of the things that I needed to get out of my chest for this part of the review. I give this movie an eight out of ten. I'd give it a nine out of ten. Loved it. I'd agree with that. 9 out of 10. Alright, 9, 9, 8. Daniel and David, we are back for part 2 of Star Wars The Force Awakens review. Star Wars Episode 7, The Force Awakens. This was really, just took me back to my childhood um, in a lot of many ways. And really, it's the Star Wars movie that I'd always wanted to see fresh in the movie screen for the first time. Um, I really don't have very much to say uh, or complain about it other than that I really enjoyed it and I came out of the theater pumped and also engrossed by uh, the stakes that they have raised and also many of the elements that they've decided to go with uh, completely surprised me and for the longest time I had that sinking feeling in my gut like my heart had dropped Um, because of a couple of things that had happened in the film. And even now, I'm still trying to get over it and, like, still in denial that those things actually happened. And I'm like, what is going to happen to the canon uh, for Star Wars now uh, that this has happened? So I'm just pumped, really, to see where this uh, saga in a galaxy far, far away is going to go from here. Uh, you know, I grew up watching the original trilogy, so for me, it's kind of like the holy text for, you know, what is Star Wars, and I remember back in uh, 1998, when they started doing the promos for the prequel movies, and I don't know if you guys remember when they were showing, like, the Pepsi commercials, and then they had, like, um, the characters that were on the the cans for that, and they made a big deal out of that, Mm. and um, when the movie came out in 99, and I went to the theater to go see it as a kid, I think I was about 16 at the time. And, um, you know, I was pumped, because I was like, all right, more Star Wars. Um, The movie played, everything felt wrong from the beginning of it, until about the last 15 minutes of the movie, with Duel of the Fates fight, that actually felt like real Star Wars, and then it ended. And then, you know, skip to um, 2002, when Attack of the Clones came out. Um, Again, massive disappointment, for the most part. Skip to 2005 massive disappointment for the most part. Skip to 2015 with The Force Awakens and Lucas no longer being, you know, the guy calling all the shots. You know, it it, it felt to me like they had finally recaptured that magic that had been missing that the prequels didn't have. Uh, the Force Awakens, you know, did things to, like, really get your attention and it had the benefit of being a sequel to Return of the Jedi so none of us knew what was going to happen. 
you know, with the prequels, we already had an idea of what was going to happen, who was going to survive, how the events were going to play out ultimately. So it didn't feel as magical to me because of that, because we already knew the foregone conclusions there. And I loved that they went back to using the practical sets, you know, with the creatures and the ships and the cities. It was very minimalist with um, the locations that they went to. There wasn't a lot of CGI in the background distracting you and taking you kind of out of the moment with the characters. I loved uh, Kylo Ren because he, you know, yes, he threw little fits every once in a while, but that's what I liked about him because he was unpredictable. He was and he was extremely powerful. So, yes, he was acting like a child, but at the same time, this is a very powerful child that you wouldn't want to piss off. So, to me, that's an interesting villain, and I can't wait to see how he gets shaped in the following uh, installments. And, you know, then the other thing is, I like that um, Ray ended up being the protagonist of the movie, when all of the advertisements made it seem as if maybe Finn was the chosen one. But that wasn't the deal. They actually used Ray as the chosen one. I was amazed that they actually used Ray as the chosen one because, you know, it seemed like there was going to be a couple times where, you know, especially during the climactic fight between Finn and uh, Kylo Ren, it's like, okay, he's got the lightsaber. This is going to be our guy for the trilogy. But no, he gets beat within like a minute. <clears throat> and then, of course, the most, you know, crowd cheering moment with uh, Ray pulling the lightsaber past Kylo Ren to herself. And I just, I was impressed that they were uh, willing to go that route. And I think that's going to change the way people look at Star Wars going forward. And I, I like that they, uh, they killed off Han Solo because they did something that's going to get people talking until the next episode. So it, it gives it a little bit of that oomph until, you know, episode eight. Hmm. Well, at least for the general audience, they everybody's gonna want Kylo Ren to, you know, eat it after right. taking down uh, Han I like Solo. that. It gives it gives us motivation to hate the main villain. Yeah, you know, pro proper motivation to hate him, and you should you should hate the main villain, and now everybody does. Yeah, and that was one of the moments that I was uh, referring to, and I had that pit in my stomach because I just had the sinking feeling something's gonna happen. One of our the char canon characters that we have loved for decades is going to bite the dust. And I just had this feeling it's going to be Han. It's going to be Han. And then when he comes face to face with Kylo Ren, I'm like, okay, here it comes. Yeah, here it is. Here it comes. Um, and they toyed with us a little bit as the audience because we're kind of like, wait, is he going to change his mind? And like, no, wait. And ah, oh, there it is. <laughs> and I'm like, no, Han Solo, don't die. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. you should. <laughs> yeah, because you could tell when he was telling Han, you know, you know, help me. He wasn't saying, help me turn back to the light. He was saying, nope. you know, help me turn to the dark side completely. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, but of course, Han, yeah. Han didn't pick that up because he wanted to believe that he could still bring his son back to him. Yeah. And, you know, unfortunately, it ended up being one of my uh, two big negatives. Because, I mean, I know we're supposed to feel something here. That, you know, aside from, you know, oh, this guy's got to die now. He killed the, one of the greatest characters, if not the greatest character of the Star Wars universe. But, right. it, like I said with uh, Benjamin and Catherine, it felt very telegraphed. And the emotional weight, for me, just wasn't there. However, I did like that, you know, it's very new. Because sometimes they're always telling people in these movies... You know, stay in the light, don't go to the dark side. But you have a character here in Kylo Ren who comes from the light and he wants to go to the dark. They're trying to bring him, you know, back to the light and he's just fighting against the light. And I always felt like, yeah, he's, you know, he's, it's kind of like a ceremony. You think that what he's saying is something that Han Solo wants to listen, but at the same time, he's doing it to, I guess, build himself up to, all right, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Bzz. Ah, I did it. Yeah. You know, the other thing I like about Kylo Ren is he's the flip side of uh, Luke Skywalker. Because in the original trilogy, Luke Skywalker was always worried that he was going to get seduced by the dark side. You know, whereas Kylo Ren is worried that he's going to get seduced by the light. Mm -hmm. You know, I like how they, they turn that on its head. Yeah. Him. Second thing that I didn't like was the whole Captain Phasma thing. Man, I was yeah, so she did. excited. She did, not, she did not get nearly enough time. It was 
too underutilized. Way yeah. too underutilized. Yeah, I mean... Never even had an opportunity to see her without her helmet on. No. No. I mean, clearly, I mean, the way her popularity was going, like, you know, okay, she's going through the whole Boba Fett thing. She's very becoming popular through the merchandise. But they were really advertising her in Empire Magazine, and her oh, yeah. Weekly. I'm like, wow, she's going to be not just a new... Boba Fett type of a character, but she's going to be, you know, 100% badass. Whether it would have been a man or a woman underneath that mask, here we're getting a badass, and a badass she was not. And Kathleen Kennedy has said that they have big plans for her, but at the moment, I'm just not really buying it. Yeah, exactly. So, as, I no, said, gonna, as I said in the first really part, I'm in just like... Eight. Yeah, as I said in the first part, I'm just like, yeah, I don't really give a shit anymore. I mean... Episode 8 might change that completely, but until that happens, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm, you're, you, you know, you have one job, guys, you have one job. Well, I, I'm, I'm going to say something that's going to be unpopular with a lot of people. All right. I don't, I don't like Boba Fett. You know, I think that Boba Fett is overrated. Um, he had a really cool looking design, um, but if you really think about it in the original trilogy, that guy only has, like, what, three minutes of screen time in Empire Strikes Back? Yep. And maybe three minutes of screen time in Return of the Jedi. Mm-hmm. Yet, yet there's this huge following for him. I don't I don't get it. Yeah, it was and a merchandise at the time. That's what really... Mer- and it, I think it's going to ultimately be the same thing with Captain Phasma. That she's going to take that Boba Fett role of barely there, but she looks cool, so mm-hmm. the toys sell. Yeah. And there's a weird cult following. Yeah. I don't know if it was Catherine or Benjamin that mentioned it, but it would have been better if the shock trooper that Finn fights changed that guy and put Phasma there. That would have made her more memorable. Oh, that that would have been brilliant. Yeah. I don't know why they didn't do that. Yeah. Which in and of itself, it's amazing that Finn was able to last as long as he did. Not only that, but I think in the climactic battle, it really should have been... Uh, Captain Phasma versus Finn and Kylo Ren versus Rey at the same time. Because and weren't they playing? Yeah, they were playing up this rivalry between Phasma and Finn through this whole time. Right. You know, right. like they, they had several crossings yeah. with the yeah they had several crossings with each other, and there's like this little power struggle going on between the two of them. Right. And they didn't use that, so they, it felt like a missed opportunity during the climax. Exactly, and I know I've heard other people in podcasts and other YouTube channels saying that, well, if you read the novels leading up to this movie, and I'm just like, no, shut up, all right? You're assuming that everybody who's going to see this movie is already, you know, pre-exposed and is already initiated to what they're about to see, and you really can't depend on, you know, material that the majority of the movie-going audience is not really going to touch. I mean... Not to, you know, say anything negative towards you, Dan, but you know how you're watching Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and you're enjoying how they're introducing the Inhuman characters, right? Correct. And they're having the Inhumans movie coming out in 2019, which, by what's happening right now, whatever's happening there, you know, once that movie comes out, you're already invested so much knowledge that, you know, you're expecting some things. But you can't expect the rest of the world to, you know, be tuned in to Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., so that when Inhumans comes out, you know, oh, well, I already knew that. Right, right. And they probably, they might not even use any of those characters from the show in the movie. Exactly. So I so, have to brace myself for that. <laughs> yeah. So, let's talk about something new. I mean, I've already expressed, you know, the negatives. Ray character, we can all agree, she's, you know, fantastic, as well as Poe Dameron and Finn. This is really a very character-driven movie. I mean... Right. Despite the fact that it really feels like a New Hope, Empire Strikes Back, and Return of the Jedi jumbled into one giant, circular, planet-sized death weapon excluded. I like that Rey was basically a combination of Luke Skywalker and Han Solo. She basically has all the traits of both of them. Um, As far as the criticism goes, that she's overpowered. You know, basically all the Jedi are overpowered. All the Sith are overpowered. So, really, that's a non-argument um, for anybody that has that criticism. Because that's, that's always been the standard with the series, and the video games, and the books, and the movies, and everything. They're, they're always overpowered, and it's all about how everybody around them is shaped by their actions. So, you know, that is going to be the basis with the new trilogy between Grey and Kylo Ren. 
Mm. And um, I, I've I've always liked that about Star Wars. To me, that's what makes it fun. And I think they they nailed that really well with uh, Ray and Kylo. Yeah, I really like the Ray character as well. Uh, there's an element about her where there's a huge mystery. You, you don't exactly know where she's come from or what she's doing on that planet. Um, and then really just discovering herself throughout the course of the film. And like we said before, we were kind of meant to think that we're going to be following this other character, but really it's Ray the one that we're going to be following. And what I think is really fun here is that, uh, you know, Ray. Obviously, she's attuned to the Force, doesn't really know how to go about using it, and isn't particularly skilled full-on yet with uh, using a lightsaber for combat. And in some ways, I kind of felt like Kylo Ren was a little bit that way as well. Like, they were both fighting each other very well in their final duel in the film, but they are also kind of just nicking each other. You know, like a little, a, a little stab there and a little slice there. Uh, as a, as a, I, I was expecting someone to lose a limb, but instead we get a nice slash across Kylo's face, which I think is really cool. And you can say that Ray really left his mark on him, her mark on him. Yeah, yeah I believe she stabbed him, and I think she cut his hand off. No, and I, even, no, oh, I and think Kylo, she and, cut the and, lightsaber and, uh, and off. And didn't Finn? Oh, shoot him? is that what it was? Yeah. No, was it? And didn't like Chewbacca or Finn shoot him as well? Yeah, Chewbacca shot him, I guess, you could say point blank in the thigh or something like that. Yeah, with the bowcaster. Yeah. Which would, I guess, even the plane field. But even at the same time, Finn lasted a little too long. That uh, slash to the back should have happened earlier, I think. But, again, that's a little nitpick, and I'm not really going to expand on that. Yeah, the other thing I don't understand with that is um, Kylo could have easily just uh, taken that lightsaber away from Finn at any time. You know, he could have forced it away from him. Yeah, but I, I think that what the movie was trying to do is that that lightsaber is not meant for Kylo Ren. So I think they were playing out the fact that that lightsaber wouldn't have answered to his call anyway. You know what I want to know? I want to know how that lightsaber is even there. Because if we go back <laughs> to Empire Strikes Back during the climactic battle between Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader, when Luke gets his hand cut off by Vader that lightsaber in his hand just goes flying down to the bottom of who knows where in the city of Bespin. Yeah. So, how in the world did Maz Kanata have that? You know, we gotta get some kind of backstory there. Well, as have... Maz Kanata said, that's a good question for another, for another time. Pat. <laughs> yeah, like, no, I want to know now. This is the yeah. official movie. Here's, here's what I'll say about that. In the expanded universe, and this movie really draws from the expanded universe... Definitely. Apparently, there was a junk droid who finds it and, I guess, takes it as a collector's item. And somehow it makes its way back to the new Jedi Temple and all that stuff. So, something like that might happen. Maybe because Mas Kanata is, you know, the new Yoda of, the, of this new trilogy. Maybe we'll get a backstory there. Or maybe we'll get Billy D. Williams in Episode Eight, and he'll be the reason why the lightsaber came back. Well, it is his city, so yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Very character-driven series, you know. Immediately, the moment you see uh, Poe meet Kylo Ren for the first time, the tone of the movie is set like, so how's it going to work? You're going to talk first? I'm going to talk first? You know, it shows that, yeah, this is still Star Wars. We're going to have some fun with it. And they do. They do have some fun with it. The chemistry is electric. The relationship between man and robot is infectious. BB-8, you know, we knew from the start that this this little droid was going not only to be one of the most marketed uh, merchandisable characters of the series, but he is going to be instantly, you know, adorable, lovable, everybody's favorite character, Sans Rey, and that's what he particularly was. A character that doesn't really speak and doesn't really, you know, show facial expressions, you pretty much get the entire, you know, R2-D2 times 10. I would say that my favorite part in the whole movie with BB-8 had to have been when What's-His-Face, Finn, was trying to get BB-8 uh, to, yeah. to say where the location of the Rebel um, base was, and he, he kind of put BB-8 in the middle between the two of them, and BB-8's kind of like looking back and forth between them, it's like, fuck, what am I supposed to say? answer? And then, uh, you know, Ray looks at him and is like, well, what is it? And he says it. He's like, yeah, thanks, buddy. And then he basically gives him the middle finger with the... Uh, I, 
at first I thought it was the he was giving him a thumbs up, but when I saw no, the second that's, that's, time, I'm like, oh fuck you, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, he, he told him to fuck off. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> if you put him in the middle like that, that had to have been my favorite part with BB-8. Yeah. <laughs> a few of my other negatives has to be uh, with uh, Supreme Leader Snoke. Not the, yeah. Yeah, not the character itself, but the fact that, you know, they made such a big deal about we're going to, you know, bring everything that was, you know, great about the original trilogy back, the practical effects, where you're still going to use CGI and stuff. But really, you couldn't get Andy Circus to wear a costume for that entire screen time? It looked yeah. very CGI. It was, like, very distracting. They were Am I the only one who kind of feels like when they were showing that scene with that character, or at least his holographic projection of him, that I kind of felt like I was watching a random scene out of Clone Wars. It kind of felt, it, it felt, it felt kind of random and out there, and as and also for that character, it leaves me wondering with, wait a second, so, and, and I'm just kind of going based off of the canon, I'm not entirely familiar with the expanded universe, because the Empire Emperor died in Return of the Jedi, mm -hmm. and then when Vader died, we're led to think, well, that's the end of the Sith. Well, then where did this guy come from? Well, the prevailing theory right now, and Catherine is hoping that it's true as well, is that this is, in fact, Darth Plagueis. Aha! Uh -huh. Okay, I can right. play with that. Because if you look at his forehead, he's got a scar on his head. It would be reminiscent of what um, Palpatine did to him back in the prequel series. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, nothing wrong with the character, you know, itself. It's the design and how they execute it. I mean, at first I thought there is no way in hell a giant in this universe exists and knows the ways of the dark side. Because, <laughs> you know, that'd be like, okay, so we're fighting Godzilla in, the, in this new trilogy. Um, but is he really that size, or is no, he just projecting himself to be bigger than that? I think, it, I think it's a power thing. He's, he yeah. wants himself to be projected that big to be overlording over everyone else. He's probably small. Yeah, um, he probably is. He probably is like a dark version of Yoda, very tiny. Um, but either way, Yoda was still, you know, a motherfucker. That's how powerful he is. Oh, was. yeah. Um, he just wants to appear imposing. Yeah, it's just that, you know, we're, you know, we all know how holograms work in this universe. So, it, you know, it felt a little off-putting that, at least for him, they're playing him up as this larger-than-life character when really it's a projection. So maybe he has a god complex, and that's, you know, anything can happen with this character at this point. I mean, pretty sure episode 8 is going to deal with, you know, how this Supreme Leader Snoke seduce, you know, uh, Kylo Ren. If we're actually actually going to see the Knights of Ren in the next movie and all that stuff. Um, it's amazing how a character who can hold a bolt blaster in midair for a good five minutes <laughs> can have so much trouble <laughs> later on. I mean, yes, he was wounded, but god damn, you'd think a, par a character with abilities like that would be able to take care of everything else, no problem. It's one of those plot holes things that, you, you know, you really can't ignore, but you're at least thankful that the movie is going at a certain pace that, you know, it's at least still entertaining and not as distracting. Well, in terms of that climactic battle and why he got his ass handed to him, I think part of the reason why Ray really laid into him is because, um, you know when they have their uh, lightsabers crossed? Yeah. And he's he's about to push her off the edge, and um, he tells her that she needs a teacher? Well, in that part, I think she went into what they call the, the Jedi uh, battle meditation, which I think is either part of the expanded universe or not. Yeah, and, but that uh, in itself is a little troublesome. Okay, yes, it could be a theory that she is either, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm not yet buying into the theory that she's Luke's daughter because people would have known that was her. Um, right. Maybe she's she's a daughter of a pupil of Luke Skywalker, and maybe she was, you know, strong with the Force and stuff like that. But you know, if we're led to believe that her mind was wiped of her training with the Force, fine. But contextually speaking, they're not really giving us, you know, okay, how does she know about Jedi mind tricks? How does she know to tap into the Force as quickly as she is? I mean, somebody, I think it was Benjamin who said that, well, there was an awakening. The Force was willing her to do everything because the Force needed her and willed her to win. Okay, 
it was on, it was just the execution that really just threw me off, and that's why I didn't like it as much as everybody else did. Right, we need episode eight and nine to fill that in. <laughs> yeah, and thank God that that is a guarantee because if this was years ago, begging for episode eight would have been uh, you know getting down on our knees and praying. Cause Whereas it, now it's a foregone conclusion; they're actually going to start filming within a month. Exactly. So now it's a foregone conclusion to get your answers, and you have a guarantee of a set of movies coming out. Which thirty years ago that was you know crazy talk. Right, Lucas said for the longest time, I will never do a sequel trilogy. Hmm. Yeah, even though after all he said about, well, I already have the treatments for 7, 8, and 9. But yeah, motherfucker, shut up. All said and done, it's still a good movie. Great for others. It, the biggest crime this movie could have done was be on the level of the prequels. That is the biggest crime it could have done. And I have a feeling that uh, Disney probably knew that they they had to come out and please. They bought Star Wars, they had to come out and tell the fans, okay, we're going to do this, and we're going to make it amazing, and we're going to blow away expectations. And th uh, they, quite frankly, succeeded in many levels. Is it the best Star Wars film? Probably not, but it is certainly far from the worst. Yeah. So, I'm very pleased with uh, how they executed this film, and really, the stakes are a lot higher now the firepower that we witnessed. Because before, in the previous trilogy, we were told about the millions of voices crying out in terror, but this time they showed it to us. Oh, yeah. Oh, and yeah. I that's, that's a good shaking point. shaking in my chair at that moment. Yeah. I was just thinking, this can't be happening. Someone please stop this before it happens, and then... It oh, happens. Crap. And then, in a small way, the destruction of that system was... In a kind of a strange way, for me, kind of a, okay, the Lucas era is over. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was basically their way of nuking. New direction. The, yeah, that was basically their way of nuking the, the prequels, because the area they destroyed was the, the New Republic. Focus. Yeah, the area <laughs> that was destroyed was the focus of the entire prequel trilogy. Right, and they just nuked it. Yeah. So did they really do away with the entire Republic? That, that one system? Yep. Yeah. The Hosnian system made up the New Republic. They destroyed it. Huh. It's, it's gone. Yeah, that was really, like, another thing that I, you know, should have brought up is that they've never really explained it clearly. Like, the First Order and the Republic and all that stuff. But, I mean, it doesn't. I guess at this point it doesn't really matter because the Republic is, you know, gone. Space dust. But, you know... In that crawl at the beginning, they maybe could have added at least one more paragraph and have it, you know, a little better, more explained. I mean, since we're going back with Lucas, at least in A New Hope, when you have that round table discussion with all the admirals and Darth Vader's in the room, they're at least talking about what the current state of the galaxy is. Right, and they, and they cover all of that within, like, three minutes, and you've got a good idea of what's going on. Yeah, so I wish we could have had, like, a repeat of that, and everything else would have been, you know, fine. But, again, I'm curious to know, because yes, the, while the Republic may be gone, I'm kind of curious what, you know, the demise of the Starkiller base does for the First Order. Not how, much. How, mu how, much of a, how much does this level the playing field, in a sense? Not much, because apparently they were able to increase their forces tenfold, and able to build and terraform an entire planet into a super weapon with ease. And that's another thing that I was thinking of, like, how was that going on and no one caught on? Exactly. Again, like I said, they really didn't fully explain the, you know, I know it's 30 years and you got to catch up, but it really shouldn't take that long for, you know, a new republic to form and, you know, start, you know, hunting down, you know, the remainder of the empire, but, you know. All right, and, and clearly the Starkiller base was close enough to the Hosnian system to shoot at it. So you would figure, if it's that close to shoot at, why didn't they bring some X-Wings over there and just blow up that sensitive or that vulnerable part, you know, 29 years ago when they started to do it and just prevented that whole thing from happening? Yeah. You know, it's, I don't know. It's a plot hole. Yeah. And, th yeah, this movie is riddled with a lot of plot holes. I mean, some of them very obvious. Others you really have to think about to get to them. But, like I said... Yes, they're there, but it really doesn't harm the experience as much. 
Oh no, it's still a true Star yeah. Wars. Unless you're a true cynical asshole, then that's your problem. But right, you know, <laughs> it really shouldn't. You know, because believe me, if I could point out the 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 heavy of plot holes in a lot of my favorite movies of all time, none of us are going to be happy. So yeah, and, at, and at the end of the day, they they captured the the spirit of fun that the original trilogy had. Exactly. So, to me, that, that's the most important thing to me. I was like a little kid when yep. I was watching that. Yeah. So, overall, like I said in the first part, I'm giving this movie an 8 out of 10. I would give it a 9.5 out of 10. I'm going to give this a 9 out of 10. All right. As soon as you start listening to this review, you know, it's all going to be in one singular setting, so we'll be jumping from one part to the next. My name is Russell Martinez. Dan and David, thank you for joining me. As always, bye-bye, guys.